Florida, among Florida birds. So uh, uh, we'll turn it over to Mitch. Thank you for coming. Oh, of course. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for having me, guys. Um, we are going to take a hard left turn from reddish egrets and Wilson's plovers and limpkins to a very, very different set of birds in a very, very different part of uh, the United States. So um, uh, I had the wonderful pleasure of going to Southeast Arizona uh, this last summer. Um, and I, you know, was so taken by it, took a lot of pictures and had a lot of great, uh, a lot of great, you know, uh, kind of experiences and encounters with stuff. And I really wanted to share that experience, um, with people that, uh, appreciate it like you guys. Um, so because you guys were already kind of using the chat already, let me see if I can, uh, I'm curious to know, uh, how many people have, um, have, have been to Southeast Arizona. So if you've, uh, if you've done the birding there before, can you just type in whether you uh, uh, yes or no? Um, and I'd be curious to know. Uh, just type yes, I've been. No, I have not. Oh, my goodness. Has anyone not been? Okay, going in. <laughs> okay, someone. Okay, good. Twice. Look at this. Are people just nervous at this point now for even saying no? Okay. Um, there we go. All right, Karen. I see you. And uh, Christiana, I see you. Okay, 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 okay. Want to go back? I, I agree with you, totally with you on that. Okay, so there's a mix. Uh, uh, so some people have not, some people have, and I'm sure uh, most people who have not maybe have uh, are familiar with the lore that is Southeast Arizona. So because I'm an ecologist, um, uh, as, as a PhD student, since, since I study ecology, um, I am going to kind of incorporate. Uh, this talk is going to kind of be, you know, is going to be. Going, I'm going to be talking about the trip itself, the birds that you can see, um, and where to go. And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the ecology of these species to help you guys better understand where to find species at particular sites, what microhabitats. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I go to eBird and I look at uh, Madeira Canyon, that's a big, that's a big area, right? And if it says varied bunting is found there, you know, it's important that you understand what type of habitat does the varied bunting like so that you're not looking around for it in a place that it's probably not going to be. Okay, so uh, got to we're going to incorporate a little bit of the uh, ecology in here. So, right, so what makes Southeast Arizona special? That'll be the first part I'm going to talk about. Um, and then what birds you can see and where and then why I understand their ecology. Okay, right. So what makes Southeast Arizona special? Well, it has something called the Sky Islands, right? And the Sky Islands are this isolated group of, they kind of look like little lakes, right? Um, uh, that basically bridge two very, very different uh, mountain ranges, right? So you have sort of the, uh, the Colorado Plateau and Rocky Mountains up north, which of course are very temperate and bring a certain, uh, certain group of avifauna in. And then what makes it really special and what makes people who are, you know, who are really keen on increasing their U.S. list or their ABA list, right? They come to Southeast Arizona because it also incorporates the subtropical uh, realm and climate of the Sierra Madres, right, which of course are in Mexico. And so this climate and the, and the, uh, and the plants and stuff that, that, you know, come in from here, right, they only occur in this one part of the United States and nowhere else. And this is why it's the only place you can see really cool species like elegant trogon and Montezuma quail, which is what I had pictured in the very beginning, and then that violet crown hummingbird. Right, so that's what really makes it quite unique, and so you get a, a nice amalgamation of these of these two different bird communities. So then, if you divide the habitat up, there are many different subhabitats and things, but really there are kind of four main groups of habitat, right? With all very different bird communities. Okay, at the driest end, you have the Sonoran Desert. Okay, very beautiful, very dry. Right, the trees of the desert, of course, are the big saguaro cactus, or as actually as they say in Tucson, it's saguaro without the G, so they say Swaro, which is very interesting. I didn't know that. And then as you get closer to the Sky Islands, at the base of them, you have the mesquite grassland, okay, at, pictured at number two. That's really what it is. It's grass and mesquite bushes. And then when you make your way into the Sky Island, you enter the oak pine riparian woodland. And then as you start to climb in elevation, right, 2,000 meters or so, you start to get into the mixed conifer forest. Okay. What also makes Southeast Arizona great is that there are established eBird hotspots, right? It's a small region, 
and people have been going there for a long, long time, and we know exactly where a lot of these things are, especially the resident species. Um, so it's easy to plan a trip of your own, unlike a place like Alaska, where it's just so big and wild and untamed, you know, uh, Arizona can be, Southeast Arizona can be a fairly simple uh, trip to plan um, for a short period of time. And then another thing that's quite nice is that it's very compact. Like I said, it's a very small area. So we didn't have to drive more than an hour, hour and a half between most of our sites, right? Like when I went to Alaska, I had to drive, you know, four or five hours to places, right? So um, you spend more time birding, less time driving and commuting, which is always a nice plus. Okay, so I was there uh, um, for one week with a friend of mine, and uh, we were there the first week of uh, July, which um, in terms of what would be the ideal time to go in uh, in the summer, um, probably I would say like late May, um, early June, perhaps when birds are really starting to breed and sing a bit more active. So if you really want to have really good encounters with like a lot of the owl species and the nocturnal birds a bit earlier in the in the summer, later in the spring is probably ideal. Like I was there in July and we heard them, but they were not really responsive to playback. And so uh, I think that an earlier time period might be better for that. But we still saw like pretty much everything, like 98% of the stuff that's there. So you can still go. And it's important to go there before the monsoon season hits, right? And you're just covered in rain all the time. So July, so the first week of July, um, was uh, was still quite good. So here's the map that we took. We spent one day in the Tucson area. Um, now, it sounds like a lot of you have been um, down in this area before, uh, but for those of you who have not or may, may not have uh, visited the Southwest much, right, and seen, you know, the, the, these habitats I talked about, right, going in Tucson could be a really nice stepping stone just to kind of just dip your feet into the birds of the Southwest and see your roadrunners and your Abert's towhee and, you know, things like that. Right. But if you really want to just get right into the, the, the specialty guys, right. You can go right into the, um, into the, into the mountains there. And so uh, I'm going to talk about three different places in Tucson and then get into the first of the sky islands, which are the Santa Rita mountains where the famous Madeira Canyon lies. And then another great eBird hotspot is Patagonia Lake. Um, state park, totally different ecosystem from the Sky Islands, very lowland. And then another mountain range to cap it off, which was the Huachuca Mountains. Now, since a lot of you have been, I'm sure you also are aware that there's another Sky Island that's very famous called the Chiricahuas. And so uh, we didn't have time uh, to go there. Um, I had to go, I had to rush home to see my sister because she, she just gave birth to her first kid, who's now uh, five months old, little Lucas. So as much as I wanted to go to the Chiricahuas, I had to go see little Lucas, right? I think it was worth it. So, um, but if you do want to go back, if you do want to go to the Chiricahuas, it is pretty much the only place in the, in the, at least in the U.S. where you can see Mexican chickadee. Um, it's just, it's pretty much only lies in that one uh, mountain range. Um, but for the most part, it's another great chance to see a lot of the same stuff in the other mountains. Okay, so there we go. One week, here we go. And we start off in a place called Sweetwater Wetlands. When I gave this talk to the Alachua County group, they were, uh, they were chuckling because you know if you if you if y'all haven't been much uh, spent much time in the Gainesville area, Sweetwater Wetlands Park is like our best and most visited eBird hotspot, and the Sweetwater Wetlands Park in in Southeast Arizona also had like a, a ridiculous number of checklists, like thousands upon thousands. So I I told my friend like we got to go here. This seems like it's a pretty good spot, and it kind of looks like the Sweetwater Wetlands in Alachua County, um, boardwalks, little lakes kind of a little riparian zone. You can see why it's so good because it's this nice oasis in this really dry urban kind of landscape. It becomes a common theme with these eBird spots. Now, it's a great place to see, like I said, to dip your toes to see some of these birds, right? Um, right off the bat, right out of the uh, gate, we got to see this beautiful look at a vermilion flycatcher, which is funny. Normally we'd be going ooh and ah here in Florida, but <laughs> Vermilion flycatchers have been showing up in Florida. I don't know what they're doing, but they, uh, they've been hanging around, but um, few and far between, whereas that is not the case in Arizona. And this is a very, very good, uh, very common riparian bird. In this habitat, uh, we also came across some really nice family groups of Cooper's hawk. And then again, another bird that I was thought would be ooing and aahing amongst the crowd, but tropical kingbird has already been seen in Florida, but it was also seen at this park. So you can tell the uh, um, tropical kingbird from other kingbirds in the area like Cassins and Western um, by the kind of that longer bill. And I think it has uh, 
much more vibrant colors and contrasting of that green, yellow, and like kind of gray compared to the western and the cassins. Um, another one of my favorite birds is the black-tailed gnatcatcher. Okay, you see a male, it's easy to tell because of the black cap, but blue-gray gnatcatchers also occur. And the one way you can tell them apart from uh, from black, so way you can tell black-tailed from blue-gray, if it's not a male, is to look at the undertail coverts. Under the tail, it's black for a black-tailed and white if it's a blue-gray. So uh, just a few other species that you can see at this park, Abert's Toey, Lucy's Warbler, black chin Hummingbird, Bell's Vireo, Gamble's Quail, Mexican Duck. Um, you will see these birds again. Like I said, just dip your toes, okay? Now, there is a national park, Saguaro National Park. You could spend a whole day here, especially if you've never really done much time in the desert. And this is a very good, I think a good representation of what the landscape is like. And it doesn't look like there's a whole lot there. That's why I love desert so much. But if you go to the Red Hills Visitor Center, visitor centers are always a great place to start in a big park. There are also a lot of uh, trails that you can, as you're commuting from Tucson to the Red Hills Visitor Center, there are lots of little overlook trails that you can kind of pull off to. And we did that, Here was the, here's what it looked like. And birds that you'll very likely see, like black throated sparrow, those are like the, the house sparrows of the south of like the Sonoran Desert Southwest. They are all over the place. Uh, not a bad bird to see all the time. Uh, there's curve billed thrasher in the upper left, um, gambles quail on the right, and then it's pretty much impossible not to go through the Sonoran Desert and hear the cackling of the cactus run. They kind of sound like a like a kind of thing. Um, and here's one doing its best uh, rock wren impression. I don't know if that just happened to be the photo that I have, but that's a great bird um, and a great iconic one for that habitat. There is another cardinalid to be aware of. It's not just northern cardinal. Northern cardinal does occur in southeast Arizona, mostly in the riparian areas, the lowland riparian zones, but not really the desert. But Perloxia, free beard, anyone who can spell that one off the top of their head. Uh, but yes, Perloxia is also um, out there. They sound very similar to a cardinal. So this is a place where you kind of have to just double check to make sure it's not Perloxia or cardinal because they can overlap a little bit. And then of course, who doesn't love road runners, right? They literally just run across the road. So just anytime you're commuting anywhere in the desert areas, just look, just look at any path because they could just, whoop, they could just run right by. Um, other species that you'll see in these, in this sort of Sonoran desert areas, Gila woodpecker, that's like the red bellied woodpecker of the area. They look very similar, a little less red on the top of the head. Gilded flicker, sound just like a Northern flicker. Burden, Canyon wren, white winged dove, and then Harris's hawk. So Harris's hawk, I put an asterisk next to that because it's one we did not see. And it turns out um, if you want to see that bird, it's best to go into some of the urban parks of uh, uh, sort of desert urban parks of, uh, of Tucson. That's that uh, just looking at eBird, that seems to be where they're accumulating a lot more than in the national park. So if you want to get a look at that bird, which is a very special one, um, that would be the place to, those would be the kind of parks to look at. Okay, so, um, at about, let me think, it was about 10 a.m. at this point, 10.30 in the morning, and it was 106 degrees. So that's one thing about going into Air Southeast Arizona in July is it can get real hot real fast. So the birds are quiet, everybody, nobody wants to be there. So we took the trip up to Mount Lemon, which is about an hour and 20 minutes from the Red Hills Visitor Center, and it was a nice cool 84 degrees up there. Um, it felt like just the morning had repeated itself. And so this is the type of habitat that you see when you go up to Mount Lemon. This is mixed conifer forest, okay? Um, and uh, it's a really cool place. Now there are, uh, this is what it looks like on eBird. So there are a number of different places that um, are pretty good. Uh, my friend and I had our best luck in the butterfly trail area in the Marshall Gulch area. You can certainly do well in other spots. But we, everything that I'm about to show you, we saw in this area. So pulling up to the butterfly trailhead, very first bird we saw when we stepped out of the car was our first Southeast Arizona specialty, which is the yellow-eyed junco, All right? Looks, there's, a, there's another morph of the dark-eyed junco um, that looks very similar, but the difference is that this guy has the yellow eye, of course. And so just a couple of subtle differences. This, this, these birds really like flat areas with low shrub grass in the understory, um, which is exactly what the habitat is around the parking lot area. Um, so yeah, these guys, this was, this was 
we did not see this was the where we had them at the highest abundance was up in Mount Lemon actually I didn't see them very often um, uh, in the future but yes they were very common there. All right, um, a few species uh, to make note of so white breasted nuthatch. In Florida, pretty much the best bet of seeing that bird in Florida is you have to go up to the Tall Timbers Research Institute where I, where I did some of my research, um, but they're really restricted in Florida. But in this habitat, in this part of the United States, they are quite common, um, uh, but they are not restricted to the mixed conifer uh, forest. You can also find them in some of the pine riparian woodlands. Same thing with uh, black headed grosbeak in the upper right there. And then two more restricted in terms of the mixed conifer, the, the vireo, the most common vireo will be the plumbius vireo on the bottom left, singing away the whole time. And then the Cordieran flycatcher on the right is one of the more common uh, Impidinax flycatchers. But what are you really going up to the mountains of Southeast Arizona to see? What are you going up to in the, in the mixed conifer to see? You're really hoping to see some of these guys, right? The specialty warblers. And so, uh, the most difficult, I think, in, in my opinion, to find is the uh, olive warbler. It's actually not uh, in the Perulidae family like the rest of the wood warblers. It's in its own, it's the only member of this one family of, of birds. So it's kind of a phylogenetic weirdo. Um, they, uh, this is a species that really likes, um, I, they're a bit more higher elevation uh, preference than, um, than the, the other two I'm going to show you. Uh, they are very much a ponderosa pine Bird. They do love to nest and forage in ponderosa pine, which is also the same for the Grace's warbler, right? So Grace's warbler uh, is also very much a ponderosa pine sort of specialist. It, when you look at the various literature about where they like to nest and forage, that more often than not, um, ponderosa is the kind of the tree to go for. But you can see that the elevation range is a bit broader. They're a little; they can occur a little bit lower down um, than the olive warbler. And then my favorite of the trio has to be the uh, red-faced warbler, right? Now, this is where my friend uh, uh, Harrison Jones, so he works for this, uh, Dr. Harrison Jones, he works for this NGO called the Institute of Bird Populations. He's an avian, a Southwest avian ecologist. And he told me uh, that with this guy, unlike the yellow-eyed junco, which likes flat, these guys tend to really like areas that are sloping and areas that slope into drainages, seepages, um, creek beds, right? And it was so true. Every time we saw this bird, that was always the microhabitat. There was always slopes going down and the bird was always found in that area. So that's the kind of stuff that can really, I used to think that the three of them are essentially synonymous in habitat, but there are slight differences with them. And so that can, that's something to keep in mind if you want to increase the chances of seeing stuff. Um, so Everything, everything, we saw everything at the butterfly trailhead, but this guy was at the Marshall Gulch picnic area, and that habitat that I just described is was at the Marshall Gulch area, and that's why it was like the minute we got there, we got it, which is pretty cool. A few other cool birds. So hepatic tanager is another specialty bird. Um, they're not strictly a um, mixed conifer bird. They're also in the pine uh, riparian woodland lower down. Broad-tailed hummingbird as well. Rivali's hummingbird, which used to be magnificent. Hummingbird, um, the really the big boy, uh, mountain chickadee, pygmy nuthatch, brown creeper, Stellar's jay, they're all there. And then zone-tailed hawk, which is another one that we kind of missed out on. We didn't, I don't know what it was with the hawks. We just kind of uh, kind of struck out with them. But uh, my piece of advice with zone-tailed hawk in that part of the U.S. is look at every turkey vulture. I know it's not something that we're always clamoring to do, but uh, but yeah, there's a reason for that, right? If you're a rodent and you see a turkey vulture, you're thinking, oh, I'm fine, right? I'm not going to, that thing's not going to come after me. But so there is a little bit of, um, of sort of evolutionary mimicry kind of going on here, which is kind of why the zone tail looks that way. And so zone tailed is one that you can see in um, along these big rocky slopes up in the mixed conifer, but you can also see them down low in sort of the dry mesquite areas they can like on the bases of the uh, of the sky islands too. So um, yeah, so just always look for look up in the sky and just make sure you're checking those turkey vultures. So that was day one, right? Not too bad, okay? So uh, that was at Mount Lemon. Took us an hour and 35 minutes to get to Green Valley, which was about 20 minutes away from our first Sky Island spot, which was arguably my favorite of the whole bunch, which is Madeira Canyon. You absolutely have to go to Madeira Canyon. It is fantastic. There's Harry right there doing his best uh, John Muir impression, just looking out amongst the land. 
And uh, and this is a nice picture because it shows you a little bit of that of that progression in habitat. So right now we're at, we're in the sort of mesquite grassland, but you can as you drive further into Madeira Canyon into the campground, it'll become that pine riparian woodland. And then if you take the trails up, up and up and up, that's when you get back into the mixed conifer, right? And then those warblers can potentially crop up again, All right? So these are just some pictures on the way in. It's really really pretty. Um, uh, it's really hard not to look at it when you're, I mean, it's just, you can see it all as you're driving up. It's very, it's, it's quite a, quite a landscape. So uh, the, um, the yellow stars are the spots that we went to. Um, everything on the left side, uh, we did the first full day. And then the morning when we left, we went up to an area called Box Canyon. Um, so yeah, so let's kind of start from the top and go down. So the first two places I would recommend as you're driving into Madeira Canyon are these two places called the Florida and McCleary Wash. And they look like this on Google Maps. And this is pure mesquite grassland. Okay, this is, let me look at it. That is what it is. It is grass and mesquite bushes. And there are certain species that you're going to have a, an, uh, an easier time seeing here than any of the other habitats, including this guy, who is the very first bird that we heard and saw which is one I'm sure you're all going to want to see, which is the varied bunting. They look very, they kind of sound like a, kind of have that warbly kind of uh, fairly, fairly long duration songs, similar to a blue grosbeak and indigo bunting. They kind of have that very same tonality to it. Um, uh, but yeah, so definitely that, this is the preferred habitat for this bird. Okay. Not the other ones I was talking about. All right. So if you like your sparrows, this is definitely the place to, to go looking for stuff. Okay. So on the top there, is the uh, Rufus winged sparrow. And then on the bottom is the uh, Bauderies sparrow. Now, Casson sparrow is another one um, that used to be found in this area. But, but what I learned about the Casson sparrow is that they are they prefer more open grassland than these other two guys. The other two really like the mesquite, but the Casson sparrow love the uh, open, the more open grassland areas. And I'm imagining that over time, it's possible that some of this stuff is regenerated and the open grassland has kind of disappeared, which is why Casson's sparrow was not seen and hasn't been seen in these areas in a long time. But these two you can definitely see. Now there are some uh, physical sort of phenotypical differences. Okay, so the they're both in the same genus, but the Rufus wing kind of has that chipping sparrow, uh, uh, kind of chipping sparrow or um, field sparrow kind of kind of look to it, right? Very cute, round face, little bill. Um, they do, in fact, have a rufous wing. And then you have uh, the Bauderies on the bottom, which have a much flatter head, longer bill, right? Um, they kind of look a little bit more like the Amadramus sparrows, like your seaside sparrow and grasshopper sparrow types. But the real difference is the song. And so I'm going to play you very quickly what each of these songs sound like. They both kind of sound like a pinball being, or like a ping pong ball dropping on a table. It's like a deek, 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 deek kind of thing okay but there's a slight difference so here's what the um this is this is rufus wing sparrow very short All right it's like as if you were dropping it very close to the table All right you can see hear that ping pong motion though okay and he kind of gets right to the point do 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 whereas our bottery sparrow he is a bit more dramatic he likes to put a little bit more flair into his song before he goes into ping pong ball mode. So I'll show you what that sounds like. Okay, so there's still that trill, but it's a, a di, 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 and then eventually he decides. He's a little indecisive. Yeah, so a little bit of a longer song but still have that ping pong, ping pong ball uh, dropping on a table kind of motion. So that's really the key to understanding the difference between these guys. And so another thing to really keep in mind are the Myarchus flycatchers. So we in Florida pretty much only have the great crested flycatcher to deal with, okay, um, on a regular basis. But in Southeast Arizona, you have to deal with uh, quite a few, okay. Um, in this habitat, in this sort of, uh, the mesquite kind of bush area, um, the ash throated is probably the most common, but there are three other, there's two others to keep in mind. You have brown crested, you have dusky capped and ash throated, and they all look very similar. Okay, the gray crested is is very similar in size to the great, I mean, the brown crested is similar in size to the gray crested, it's the biggest. Dusky capped is the smallest, 
then ash throated is sort of the palest you see that that yellow and gray is a bit paler than the other two um and so i've put in just a, just some of the brief habitat differences um but there is quite a bit of overlap with these guys so um long story short is you just need to you need to be just constantly you know listening to the songs the calls and trying to look at some of these size differences but what i will say is brown crested tends to be in more of the cactus type areas um, because they tend to like bigger cavities to nest in than ash throated ash throated tend to be a bit more on the scrubbier side but both can be in riparian areas ash throated are more likely in the woodlands and then dusky capped is much more restricted. It's much more of a restricted to the Sky Island um, riparian areas, the riparian woodland areas. Okay, so um, places where you have the sycamores and, and uh, evergreen live oak, that's where they that's where they really like to kind of. Um, so you're not going to really find these guys um, outside of the Sky Islands. Okay, so we've moved our way down from the Florida Wash, and now we're into the Madeira proper. Okay see signs like this okay there are a number of uh, spots to look at right um the the d like the the hot spot where the d in madeira canyon is okay that is um the uh the lodge that's there um so if you really want to kind of you know uh, find a place to stay in madeira canyon um that, that is the place to do it but in my opinion uh the best place to really see most of the specialty birds in this area is the uh, path that goes right along this creek bed here. You can see there's a there's a hiking um, symbol there. There are various access points. We parked at the amphitheater, went down the hill there, and we're just walking along. And it looks kind of like this. Okay, this is the type of habitat in this mixed riparian woodland. So there's several tree species to keep note of. The really important ones are the are, are the Arizona sycamore. A lot of Specialty birds like to um, that I'll I'll show you in a bit love to nest in in the sycamores. Uh, there, like I said, there's evergreen oak. There's a couple of other oak species. Um, the main uh, pine in this in this habitat is the aptly named alligator juniper. I love that tree. Very very well named for that skin that, that alligator skin like bark. But yeah, this is such an amazing place. Every bird we saw was essentially a specialty of Southeast Arizona. So the most common woodpecker was the Arizona woodpecker. This is one that loves to nest in the Arizona sycamores. Okay, there are acorn woodpeckers there as well, but uh, this guy is was the most common, certainly the most vocal. There's the dusky caps on the left. They make a really, just a mournful short whistle, like a They do that kind of thing. You hear it all the time. And of course, you're also going to hear the sounds of you hear the chickadee type sounds and the one the only chickadee species you really have to worry about at this elevation in this habitat is the bridled titmouse right the most i think the most flamboyant of the titmice species and usually what what happens when you come across titmice and chickadee flocks is you'll see other species with them right so in this part of in this part of the u.s you'll get hutton's vireo joining in you'll get uh blue gray uh, uh black throated gray warbler You'll have dusky caps falling around. You'll have white-breasted nuthatches following. And you'll also have these guys following. All right, one of my favorites, which is the painted red start. So the painted red start is not really a high elevation mixed conifer bird. Not to say it doesn't overlap with the other warblers I talked about, but most often this is the guy that really is found in this habitat, right? So this is the one that you're really gonna be seeing. They're gonna be flashing that white fan tail and you know, kind of showboating across the tree and stuff like that. So uh, across the trunk. So that's a really cool bird um, to see. Uh, like, I, like I said, this is also a really good place to get a lot of your nocturnal um, birds. So uh, we went we went back in the evening and within five, 10 minutes, right? We could just hear elf owl on the left there, uh, whispered screech owl, as well as Mexican whippoorwill. They're all there, okay? We didn't see any of them. But we were okay with that. But if you want to see these guys, like I said, earlier in the in the summer, later in the spring might be a bit better. They might be a bit more responsive. And if you're going to be in a place with oaks, that means there's probably going to be some type of corvid around. So uh, it is impossible to not see Mexican jay in this area. They are loud. They're big. They're blue. And they're in big groups. And they just, yeah, it's impossible not to see them. Um, but I had no problem with them because they're they're quite cool. So Mexican jay is also there. And then, of course, I haven't forgotten one of the big ones you want to go down there and see. Got to see a pair of them, and they really, really like sycamores. 
It's the poster child, right? The elegant trogan. I love, love, love this bird. Wah, 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 wah. They kind of have that kind of call that just sort of echoes across this landscape. So you definitely want to be hiking along these trails. You want to be looking at these sycamores and you want to be hearing that, that type of, that type of call. Um, and yeah, we were just very fortunate to find a cavity, uh, an, an active cavity, which is how I was able to get such nice shots of this bird. And that's the great thing. If you're into photography, trogans are awesome because they just sit there. Right. And so as long as you're not disturbing them, they'll just sit and, and just chill out. And so it was quite a, quite a nice moment for that. So Madeira Canyon. Okay. And so uh, I'm going to kind of move a little bit quicker here. So uh, then the next morning we went to a place that I had never been to. So H Harry, so my friend Harry, he works mainly up in Flagstaff and Grand Canyon National Park and stuff like that. He hadn't, he actually had never been down to Southeast Arizona before. I had when I was about 14, 15 years old. Um, so a lot of these places I'd been to before, but Box Canyon was a new one for me. And this is what it looks like when you go into Box Canyon, right? It's only about... 20 minutes from the uh, from the uh, the turn off into Madeira Canyon, and as you can see, it's very different from what Madeira Canyon looks like, right? You can you can see it's a lot drier, more mesquite, but it's but it's got these rocky outcrops. And what's also nice about Box Canyon is that it these this this hill trickles down into a into a dry riverbed that's very riparian, and so it's very very birdy. And so this was the biggest surprise to me. I did not ex I did not know what to expect at this site, and it did not disappoint. Um, one bird, if you look at that habitat and you look up the description of this bird, it's like a perfect match. Like it's exactly written. Um, this habitat is exactly what this bird likes. And that's the guy on the left, which is the Northern beardless Terenulet. Okay. That was our only spot. We got them, but we got them in pretty good numbers. There's a lot of flowering agave plants, which attract a lot of things like Orioles. So you get both, you get both, um, hooded Oriole pictured there as well as Scott's Oriole, which is a stunning bird. Canyon toey, very, very common. Um, we also had lots of Cassin's Kingbird, Vermilion Flycatcher, a lot of the same stuff from Sweetwater Wetlands, so Verdon and Lucy's Warbler. But we also saw something very special, which is this guy, which is the Five Striped Sparrow. Now, Five Striped Sparrow used to be very restricted, like even more so. There was a place that you had to go to, some of you may have gone to, called California Gulch, which was a real pain in the butt to get to four wheel drive monstrosity and you had to get yourself way out there to see this bird. It's still the only place I think in the US at least where you can see buff colored nightjar. So if you still want to get that guy, you probably still have to make that trek. But it's, it appears to me that since I was 15, the species has expanded its range because there are various other hotspots where you can see five striped sparrow, including Box Canyon. So we think we had like 35 species on the morning, which was uh, quite nice. Black chin sparrow was another one um, that I haven't seen too often that we had there. Okay, so uh, then we made our way into the Patagonia area, right? Patagonia Lake State Park. Now, this was a two hour drive. And you might be asking yourself or asking me like, why the heck didn't you just go the opposite way and take your 30 minutes to get to Snowida? Why did you take two hours? Well, we're not crazy. Uh, it's because we wanted to stop at another spot on the way called Tubac. Okay, and uh, this is what Tubac looks like. As you can see, it's another oasis in a dry, er, a dry, arid landscape, right? And we went to a specific place called the Juan Batista de Anza Trail, right? And it is, as you can see, it is a lovely, lovely little uh, sort of um, water source with a lot more greenery than the surrounding landscape, which is very good for birds. And you might be wondering, what is the most common species you think is probably there? I don't know. Give yourself a second to think about it, right? Remember what we've seen. What might be the most common bird? Well, the most common bird is one that many Floridians can see, not in great numbers, but they're around. But it was this guy, right? Love this guy. Right? So yellow-breasted chat. Super common. I think we had about 32 individuals on that hike. Like, ridiculous, right? It's not a bad bird to be super abundant, right? Yellow-breasted chat's another weirdo, right? We don't really know what it, what it's closely related to. Is it a warbler? Is it a icterid, like a blackbird or oriole? Like, it's kind of its own thing at this point. Um, in the more open areas of this air, like, around where the road was, away from the trail, is a, was a great area to see Phanopepla, our only silky flycatcher. Beautiful, beautiful bird. I love this bird. Lovely little crest. 
red that piercing red eye and big white wing patches when it flies the female is also very pretty instead of being jet black it's like a charcoal gray all right um a, another bird that's a, that's a specialist of southeast arizona is gray hawk and this is i think one of the best places to see this bird because we also saw them at uh the previous spot in box canyon if you look up what their habitat is it is riparian it's it's like arid riparian zones with cottonwoods and that is exactly what this trail is it is perfect for that and so we saw like three or four individuals a gray hawk calling around so very good spot for that now another reason you might want to go to southeast arizona right you want to go there maybe to see some of your southwest birds or roadrunners maybe you want to go see the specialists like the trogan but then you may also have a chance at wanting to see some of the hyper rares right the ones that show up maybe once a year, maybe once every few years, or maybe it's the first time the state has ever seen it or the US has ever seen it. And our first sort of mega rare species on the trip was seen on this trail. And that was the rose-throated uh, Bacard. So there was a nest that was uh, an overhanging nest um, that took us a minute to find, but once we found it, we had to be quite patient. Eventually the bird sort of sort of uh, came and, sh and, and the male finally showed uh, showed up so I could get a picture of that nice rose throat. In case you're wondering what a Picard is, if some of you have been down to South America, you might know what the Tatyras are um, and the Chifornises. It's kind of a weird family with a lot of the species kind of look very different, but Tatyras kind of look like that and um, uh, Picards are in that are in that family. Yeah, so I mean, you can, this is, this is the type of place, the De Anza Trail is the place where you can just you can just tell it's so close to the, to the Mexican border. It's this like oasis with water source and a dry area. It's just a perfect spot to attract something, something weird, right? Like a Picard. All right. So then we made our way into the Patagonia area. This was our little, um, uh, our Airbnb it was on a horse ranch. And uh, this was the morning um, that we left, which was quite nice. And it was, what was nice about it is that it's probably the, it was the most open grassland area that we encountered on the entire trip, which allowed me to see my first lifer. Hey, which is the Chihuahuan meadowlark. So maybe not the most spectacular of, of birds, but uh, you know, it's one of those that's been split recently, you know, genetically different from Western meadowlark or from Eastern meadowlark. Um, there's slight morphological differences between these guys um, and, and called calls a little different. There's less uh, speckling um, that reaches the chest on these guys. There's far less white on the retrices or tail. Um, but hey, a lifer's a lifer. So that was my first guy, which I was pretty excited about. Okay, um, and then we went, or we made our way into the Patagonia area. And these are the various hot spots that we went to. So on the evening of our arrival, we went to the places in the, uh, the upper two spots. So the Sonoda Creek Preserve, this is all in the town of Patagonia. Uh, Sonoda Creek Preserve is essentially just like the uh, De Anza Trail. It's like a lowland riparian arid zone, so you get a lot of the same birds. We didn't really spend a lot of time because it was a lot of replicates, but there's this newly opened area called the Patent Center for Hummingbirds. So we Now, much to Harry's chagrin, because he likes to get out there and hike around and stuff, as, as do I, but as the photographer, the photographer in me loves places like this where you just, you donate money and you sit down at feeders and you watch things come like five feet from you and you get these awesome photos. I haven't talked about hummingbirds yet. Um, because, and it's important that I do because Southeast Arizona is like the, you know, hummingbird capital of the US. And I wanted to save it till this point because this is when we really started seeing some of the good ones, right? So right off the bat, look at that picture of that, of that violet crowned hummingbird. I swear I didn't take that picture, but I, I almost, I basically did. Like that's like the kind of shots you can get of these guys, right? You just sit there and they come right there. I try not to get po photos of them at the feeder. I try to find perches that they like to come to. So I just make it look a little bit more natural, but Violet Crown was there. Um, there's the Rivalis hummingbird. You can always hear a Rivalis coming in because the frequency of its wing beats um, is a lot lower than uh, the other guys because it's much bigger. And then the most common one uh, is the broad-billed hummingbird. We actually had broad-billed hummingbirds show up in Alachua County at someone's feeder. Um, and there was like a huge amount of people that went there, but these guys are a dime a dozen in Southeast Arizona. Very, very common. And so, uh, and there's also lots of other cool birds that you can see there. A lot of the stuff I've already talked about. Um, so then we went into Patagonia Lake State Park. So this is, uh, again, more of a, a lowland area. Um, oh, let me show you in the map. So, 
In Patagonia Lake State Park, there is a birding trail. Okay, makes sense. Why, if I want to go bird watching, where do I go? Go to the birding trail. And it's at the far east end. And then you go along the Sonoida Creek right here. And that's where you get most of the good stuff. So at the very beginning of your trail, it's going to look like what you see on the right, right? The dry, it's that dry mesquite grassland again. So it's that those same birds, right? You can get Perloxia there as well. You can get the varied bunting again. Um, you can get, you know, ash-throated flycatcher and Lucy's warbler and verdin, right? And then you can see that the habitat changes. Once you get closer and closer to the water, to the creek, you see it gets much more green and lush. And so a few different things start to show up. So what are some new birds here? So one bird that was quite common here was a uh, Inca dove. Okay. Um, small, looks kind of like common ground dove, but very scaly in its pattern. And it's got that long dagger-like tail instead of that little cutoff, you know, short cutoff tail that the common ground dove has. It's important to know the difference because common ground doves are also quite common on this trail. You can also see Inca dove at the patent center for hummingbirds. All right, I didn't get a picture of Abert's towhee yet, but there was, um, they are quite common on this trail. And then this guy on the left is another one that you probably really wanna see, which is um, a thick-billed kingbird, right? So obviously you can tell that guy apart from that very thick bill, but it's also it's a much bigger, chunkier bird, very pale. The difference between that white on the throat and the yellow on the belly is very subtle compared to some of the other um, the other guys, right? And uh, yeah, but that was one of the best places that we got fat bird. In fact, I think it was the only place we got thick billed kingbird. But we also went there to get another mega rarity, which was our rufous capped warbler. Now I'm going to confess, I did not take this picture. On this trip, I took this guy in, in Texas. That was my lifer encounter when I was working in Texas years ago, because the Rufus Cap Warbler that we saw in um, Arizona was uh, really, really uh, just <laughs> a real pain in the butt to see, let alone photograph. He was, if you read about these birds, these guys love understory thick vegetation, right? And so that's a nightmare to try to see. Fortunately, he was calling every once in a while, so that would put us in a direction and we would get a glimpse of him. But yeah, a glimpse is all we got. But um, I just wanted to show you what this guy looks like. So yeah, so again, another uber rarity um, showed up for us. Okay, and I'm uh, almost done here. So we went to our final spot, an hour and 16 minutes. We left the lowland riparian area of, uh, of Patagonia and went to our final Sky Island area, which are the um, Pachuca Mountains which include Carr, Miller, and Ramsey Canyon. Okay, this was the view from our Airbnb, quite nice. All right, um, these are the various hotspots that we went to. As you can see, there are a lot other, there are a lot more that you can go on, but I think these ones will do you just fine. Uh, our Airbnb was right along Ramsey Road there. Um, so we were about 10 minutes away from the Ramsey Canyon trailhead. But that evening we went to another new spot for me, which was, oh yeah, I forgot to mention, okay. We did, so this is what the Airbnb looked like, quite nice, but I say that because this was the only place we saw a bird I really wanted to see because I did not get a great look at it the first time I was in Southeast Arizona, and that is the scaled quail, which is a lovely, lovely bird. Look at that. I mean, that's like, it looks like he's got chain mail, you know, like uh, he's the knight of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the quail world, right? It's kind of got that look to him. And one thing about uh, scaled quail is they all, just like the Cassin Sparrow and the, and the metal arc I mentioned, they like more open grassland. They like more grassy areas um, uh, to forage in. So this area just happened to be quite grassy and I was pretty surprised to, uh, to see them. But yeah, a pair of them, every morning we saw them and I never saw them again. <laughs> I never saw the species again. So you just never know. Um, right, so Car Canyon, that's what it looks like. Um, uh, just a reminder, something to help you with car canyon is if you want to go on car canyon remember uh the name car because it is a very very difficult um road to traverse on you definitely need four-wheel drive to get up there there's signs that say okay don't proceed unless you have four-wheel drive so remember if you want to go on car you have to have a good car okay that's the thing i'll have to tell you about so what's the if you want to go up there what's good about car canyon um, we ended up hanging out on the reef campground in an old sawmill trail head. Very pretty spot, but it was the place where we had the best looks and greatest abundance of the uh, buff-breasted flycatcher. 
Um, so that's another specialty in this part of the U.S. They aren't found in the uh, Santa Rita Mountains, but they are quite common in the Huachucas and the Chiricahuas. Uh, this is another bird. This is a bird that kind of likes canyons, flat areas with, um, or with uh, not necessarily flat, but uh, with with very short shrub, sh uh, short uh, shrubs in the understory. But they were very, very common in this area, um, and we got, to, as you can see, they're doing quite well. This uh, family group here, and a couple of other things just to show. Uh, here's a um, brown creeper on the left. Again, very common in the mixed conifer forest, and then this inquisitive uh, rock squirrel that I took a picture of on the way up. Um, and then we went up into Miller Canyon, which I think was one of the best spots we went to. And Madeira was another one of my favorites, but Miller Canyon was excellent. This was on the very, very tippy top of the trail looking down. But when you start at Madeira at, at a Miller Canyon, it looks like this. So you're back in that oak riparian woodland. And on the, on the right side, it's actually kind of mesquite up in that area. So um, one place that you have to pass through in order to get into the Miller Canyon uh, uh, trail is this is another great eBird spot, um, which is the Beatty's Guest Ranch. So just like the the uh, the lodge out at Madeira Canyon or the Patton Center for Hummingbirds, this is a great place that you can sit and watch birds. And they do have a little uh, hummingbird area. And so we went up there and this is where we had our only encounter with another pretty uber rare uh, bird, which was the white-eared hummingbird. Very cute little guy. Um, this was pretty simple. Just went up there, saw that, saw that it was occurring there on eBird, and sat down at the little bleacher area, and within five seconds, this bird popped up and was sitting at one of the feeders. So hummingbirds are interesting. You know, I never saw a lot of these hummingbirds outside of the hummingbird feeder area, so um, these are always good places to try to get your hummingbirds. So once we got onto the trail, of Miller Canyon, we started to get a lot of these guys. We hadn't encountered them much before, but these are sulfur-bellied flycatchers. This is another bird that loves the oak riparian woodland habitat. Once you get into the mixed conifer, they disappear. When you get into the mesquite grassland, they disappear. They really like this oak riparian woodland. And they're very, very common. They're very, very loud. And uh, yeah, just something to make note of. We didn't really see them um, prior. I also have my second lifer, which was the flame-colored tanager, which is very, very exciting. Um, they've become much more common place now. They used to be like, you know, one or two like ever. And now it seems like every year there seems to be a pair showing up in Southeast Arizona. So I was very happy to see these guys. Um, they weren't quite as flame colored as I was hoping, but they were, uh, they were still very special. And we could also confirm with the visuals as well as um, from their song. Oh yeah, and this is just a couple of just differences because we do have some different tanagers here. So uh, just some differences between the hepatic western tanager which you can also see as well as flame colored tanager um uh yeah you can see that kind of that uh there's there's a few uh, facial markings that kind of separate the flame colored from the western tanager because it's important because we ended up seeing both of those species all three of those species on this trail i just took a picture here because this is showing a perfect uh, red-faced warbler habitat that nice sloping area into that into that uh stream bed I think we had one right at this spot, actually. You can see that it's very piney at this location. So we were definitely in the mixed conifer. I did a little bit of pishing at one point on the top end and had this little guy come in. So there's a nice picture of a blue-gray, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, <laughs> black throated gray warbler. There's a picture of a, uh, of a female western uh, tanager, okay, with some food. I told you it's important to know your tanagers because they, uh, they're all there. And a few other species that we saw up there, um, Virginia's warbler, greater peewee, which is another cool bird, more buff-breasted flycatcher. Okay, Virginia's warbler, I'll make note, is, is a bird that was kind of above the tree line. They like it when it gets a bit higher elevation and scrubby, so above the tree line. And greater peewee um, really like it when you get into big dead snags of trees, which is what we ended up getting when we went higher up as well. All right. Um, I'm going to kind of whip through Ramsey Canyon here. It's just another one of these uh, canyons that you can go to. Just make note that there are more restricted hours. So um, dawn, I think, was an hour before 8 a.m. at the time, and they were really, really finicky about people coming in um, before then. So just keep that in mind. Oh, yeah, I did take a little uh, video on the trail. Very, very pretty. A lot of horsetail action here. 
So yeah, definitely a place if you want to just kind of stop and just observe. Um, but yeah, this is kind of in the transition from the oak riparian into the uh, mixed conifer. I had another lifer, which was my barrel line hummingbird that now, now I've seen all the North American hummingbirds, which was great. That's one I really wanted to see. Um, we also saw the blue-throated mountain gem at this area as well at the feeders. So um, that rounded out pretty much all, most of the hummingbirds. Just a couple of other pictures from the Ramsey Canyon. There's the Hutton's Vireo on the right and the little cute little family group of uh, Northern Flicker. And then my last spot called the Ash Canyon Bird Sanctuary. So once again, another one of those, you sit down, you, you just go to the feeders and you watch. A great way to end the, end the trip. Very obvious to know where to park. Okay, there you go. Okay, there's, I just like this photograph. The white winged dove is like, you, it's like, it's impossible not to step on them. They are super common. Lesser goldfinch were all over the place in this area. And then our last of the hummingbirds was the Lucifer hummingbird was seen there. Another rarity, very small and a very long decurved bill. And then I saved the best for last, a species that I also did not get a great look at. But I found out um, on eBird that this that there were uh, there was a pair of these guys occurring at the sanctuary um, routinely. They were showing up every evening. So sure enough, we went there and we waited. And my friend Harry was was texting me and being like, "You got to get over to this side of the sanctuary right now. This bird's coming." And yeah, it came, and it was. So spectacular. I can't tell you how hard it is to find Montezuma quail, but you want to keep in mind of these things because you look at these eBird, um, you know, just I was basically scouring eBird and trying to see if there was any locations where Montezuma quail was, was occurring more frequently. But this is a bird that in much of the habitats I've described, they're, they're a bit more of the uh, dry slopes of the um, sort of mixed conifer oak riparian kind of area is where you're really start to see them. But yeah, um, it was it was a pretty remarkable um, uh, encounter. Yeah, and he got in real close to us. And yeah, what a what a bird. So what a what a great last bird to kind of finish off the trip. So in summary, um, uh, this is 136 species were detected on our trip. 423 miles were driven between 13 Ebert hotspots, um, and so just to compare, uh, that's eight, that's between then when I was when I did my trip in Alaska, it was 850 miles between four hotspots. So just showing you that it's a lot more bang for your buck, and just to show you how much it cost uh, two people or one person for that trip. So yeah, I hope that I didn't go over uh, too too far. Um, and uh yeah i i will i will take any questions people have um thank you guys so much for uh for for listening in great that was fantastic i want to go see that those birds absolutely all right lots of compliments great profiling of birds and their habitats oh good thank you thank you Ooh, great job, great job. Spectacular job from a former Tucson resident. Oh, no, that's, I mean, I, I, I take all comments to heart, but that's, that's nice to hear that someone from the area appreciated it as well. Mm -hmm. I try to, I try to keep it, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really, I saw it out how, how, how it was. So yeah, it was very, very, very cool. Very, very good. How long did you guys take to plan this? Um, so I, um, I basically did most of the, most of the planning here. Uh, I, it took me probably, um, probably took me a couple of weeks to kind of hash it out. Uh, you know, cause I, I, a lot of my, I do a lot of work with eBird with my research. And so I've become very, you know, uh, fairly skilled at like finding places and planning stuff and knowing where birds are, are occurring more frequently where we can increase the chances of seeing stuff. So it took me a couple of weeks, but you may want to give yourself a little bit more time to kind of um, hash it out. There are a lot of really good resources out there that can tell you where to begin and stuff like that. But yeah, eBird is, 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 was really the, the guide for me for picking stuff out. Nice. Mm -hmm.
But yeah, if we have any, uh, if there are any uh, questions, um, I'd be glad to answer them. Hope I didn't. Uh, hope Everybody some... said thank you for your trip. Yeah, of course. I enjoyed the trip. Yeah, yeah, we did a great yeah. job and loved how you shared the locations because of course we went and had I don't know how many days, like four days. It wasn't near enough, so it's good to no, see. No, wasn't enough. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, so I see, I see a question here about how difficult the trails were. Okay, so that's a good question. Um, uh, the most difficult would be the Miller Canyon Trail. That was kind of, um, that's just going up and up and up and up and up and up. And at one point, when you get into the mixed conifer, it starts to get very switchbacky. So it can, that one was, you know, we were kind of huffing and puffing a little bit um, at that point. Uh, and, and you can like, you know, you, you can, you know, turn around whenever you want. So some of the... So some of the Ramsey Canyon, Miller Canyon trails, I would say, were a bit more on the difficult side uh, at certain points. But, um, you know, so really anytime you're up in the high elevation, I would say, is when it gets a bit trickier. But any everything like at Patagonia Lake, Madeira Canyon in the, in the Oak Riparian or the arid, you know, kind of uh, um, uh, desert areas, super easy. You just have to bring water <laughs> if you're down in the, in the desert. That's yeah. A, yeah, I'm not kidding. 106 degrees. It was, you know, cool. yeah, it was, it was rough. Now, why did you pick that month or was that just the time you had on? Yeah, it was just what, what, the timing that we had, um, but we wanted to make sure uh, to avoid the monsoon. So we don't want to go into, you don't want to go too late in the summer. And, you know, because there, there, there's an argument to be made to go and, you know, to go there. I mean, you, you want to go there when things are breeding and a lot of these birds are there. Uh, so usually at the start of the breeding season is always probably prime because things are singing more and a bit more active. Uh, but yeah, we had, you know, now granted now Harry and I, we, you know, we've, we've done, you know, we've, we've done a lot of birding together. We've published a couple of papers together. So, you know, we are really in tune with one another. Um, but, uh, but I would say that still at the time we went, it was, um, we pretty much, I just saw like things zone tail talk and Harris's hawk, like the only things we like missed out on, but pretty much everything else. Um, we see. Okay. Uh, yeah, your, your photographer. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, Linda, can you talk briefly about your equipment? Ah, so, um, right. I will, uh, I'll type that in. So I use a Canon uh, 7D Mark II. That's my, uh, that's my camera. And I use the most recent 100 to 400 millimeter, uh, Canon lens. Um, and yeah, so I don't, I'm not carrying around one of those like monstrosities, right, with me. Uh, I find that like, as someone who loves, you know, in, is in the research, birding and photography realm, when you end up having the 600 millimeter lenses, like you're basically, you have to tell yourself, like, I'm here to photograph because you can't like lug that thing around. So that's why I love the 100, 400 millimeter because I can strap it um, and it doesn't really, it's not too much of a, of a weight problem. And the 7D is nice because it's a crop sensor camera, which means that it, it, there's a little bit of an extra zoom um, on top of that 400. So a 400 millimeter lens on a 70 ends up becoming more of like a close to 600 millimeter uh, because of the crop sensor. Versus if you get something like a 5D, which has much higher resolution and mu much more pixels per square inch, so it's a higher quality image you sacrifice um, a little bit of extra zoom. And so uh, for birds, I think it's always critical to get as close as you can. So um, and no flash or anything like that, nothing nothing crazy, no filters or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I was working with, I also have a, um, like a little 25 millimeter uh, uh, or 25 to 75 millimeter camera that I used for a lot of the more um, landscapey shots. Yeah. Any other questions? But yeah, I will, I will add, it's definitely a trip that you can plan um, pretty easily. If you want, um, you know, if you want to go with the, with a, with a, with a tour group, by all means, absolutely. I, I, I kind of see myself doing, um, you know, guiding as a form of, of, of science communication in the future. So if you want to do that, uh, go for it. But um, I think I will say this is a trip that you can, you can plan on your own, I think, and have pretty good success. Just like I said, because of how established the spots are, how easy it is to uh, um, to just drive around and stuff. So that's what I would, I will say it is an, it is an easier one to do on your own. 
Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, Everybody. I think we went down for the fest a festival. So oh nice, nice. It's a little a little short though, like Kathy said. Could Not be long. Not oh. enough time. No, no. I mean I'm we didn't even get we didn't even hit the Chiricahuas, so uh, you know, there's always more, right? And then I think there was like something like a first US record of something. I think blue black grass quit like showed up somewhere in Southeast Arizona, of course, like the two days after I left. It's just funny though, like you go into having like been in mexico several times like all these uber rare birds are just like super common over there you just go you go to like grass grassy agricultural areas in mexico and you'll see blue black grass quit like just all over the place but uh but yeah u.s listers you know it's it's special so yeah you, you always got to keep your eyes out for you know because that was the thing where i was constantly looking at ebird and just you know did something crazy show up somewhere right like did a eared quetzal like that would have been a lifer extraordinary extraordinary species for me like if that thing shows up somewhere we're going back to madeira canyon <laughs> we're going to see that thing but yeah nothing nothing too crazy like that happened i already knew what i wanted to see ahead of time yeah and david added that the southeast arizona festival in august and the Southwest Wings Festival in May and August are good opportunities if you like festivals. Okay. Yeah. And David has led it both. Oh, there you go. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, May, that makes sense. Um, August, uh, you know, like I could see August as well. Um, I'd be curious to know the benefit of going into August versus, I mean, I don't know if the rain, rainy season would already begin, but it's also actually Southeast Arizona is also really good for winter. There's like a tremendous amount of sparrow diversity and stuff that winters down there. So it's a wholly, totally different bird community. I think like you get like, um, oh, there's like, I don't know why I'm blanking on that, on that sparrow species. The only one is only, there's only two species I haven't seen in North America. One's the Harris sparrow. And then I don't know why I'm blanking on the name of the sparrow, probably because I've never seen it. But uh, I know that they winter down in, uh, I think both might winter in Southeast Arizona, so. Yeah, and he was saying there are some monsoon breeders in August. Oh. Rain mostly in the afternoon, so you bird in the morning. Okay, that makes sense. Which yeah. is like what we're used to here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. Very enjoyable. You did a great job. Thank you so good, much. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. Thank I, I, you. Of course, and I, I forgot to turn on my like my timer, so I was like kind of kind of winging it there. So I hope I didn't go like way over time. But uh, no, you're good. You're okay. Good. Okay. Good. I'm not going to a lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank no. you. All right. Thank you guys so much. And uh, yeah. Thanks everybody uh, for coming. Of course. Yes. Thank Have you. Have a good holiday. We won't see you till uh, the new year, everybody. Yep. All right. Thank you guys so much. Check out yeah. our YouTube channel. You guys have a good rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye.